Good afternoon. As I walked out on the stage just now, someone handed me a note. Let me read it to you. Mr. Hutchins, we're here today to see President Obama. And all that stands between us and him is you. So don't worry, I get it, I'll be brief. Last summer, Reverend Sharpton welcomed me, my pal Skip Gates, and my mother, the uh, grandmother of this fellow sitting in the front row here, um, my mother who is 93 years old. To All right. The, the Reverend's going to have to put up with me for a long time. Uh, to the Lincoln Memorial for the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, my mother had been there 50 years earlier for Martin Luther King's electric I Have a Dream speech, and she wasn't about, wheelchair and all, to miss the commemoration. A couple of months later, this past October, I had the opportunity to visit with President Obama in the Oval Office. And I spotted there a framed program from that historic day. It's titled, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Jobs and Freedom. Opportunity and Justice. That is still our agenda today. Right? Thank you. It is reflected in what Reverend Sharpton and Reverend Richardson fight for every day of their lives. <laughs> Working out of the House of Justice, they have dedicated their life's work to the economic and civil rights of people who truly need our help. I want to thank them both for all they do and for their inspiring example of service. Please give it up for those guys. President Obama has also been unwavering in his commitment to jobs and freedom. From the Affordable Care Act to the Race to the Top, from his proposals on equal pay for women to the minimum wage, and the host of actions his government takes every day to foster economic growth, job creation, and the expansion of opportunities for all of us. This is a president who clearly won't rest until he has fulfilled the dreams of those who gathered that day in 1963. A few weeks ago, the president called me to service he asked me to help him with his My Brother's Keeper initiative, a project designed to create ladders of opportunity for boys and men of color. The idea, his idea, is to promote early childhood education, reading skills, mentoring, and training, all of which will enable these boys and young men to stay in school, to stay out of the criminal justice system, and to secure good jobs in the modern economy. as well as to take pride in their work and in themselves. I promised the president that I wouldn't let him down and that we won't let those children down. The reverends and the president inspire us. They call us to service. But they need to understand that my mother beat them to it. She taught me, as evidently, as evidently their mothers taught them, that creating opportunity and offering justice to all is what they brought us in this world to do. Thank you. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce the chairman of NAN, the Reverend Frank Richardson. Thank you. We certainly see how the dynamics of this business of social justice walks hand in hand with the vision of our president to make American, America an all-inclusive nation. And so this partnership has had great flourish in the relationship between the President of the United States and our wonderful leader, the Reverend Al Sharpton. It is my pleasure, therefore, to present to you the President of the National Action Network, the Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you. Thank you. Let me say to all of you that have been here for our convention that this convention's value will be when we leave here and go in the trenches and protect the right to vote 
and protect the civil rights that have been gained and must be maintained. That is why, that is why this is called for 23 years, the National Action Network. It's about the action. And this is, has been framed by the president as a year of action. And he has been the action president. No president in the last 50 years has shown more action around protecting the rights of ordinary citizens and the civil rights of people denied than our action president, Barack Obama. I'm not talking about style, I'm not talking about rhetoric, I'm not talking about who would high five us, I'm talking about action. I'm talking about affordable health care was action. I'm talking about private sector jobs every month was action. I'm talking about equal pay for women, Lily Ledbetter was action. This man didn't talk, he didn't play us cheap, he brought us action, and that is why I'm proud to bring you at the National Action Network, the action president, the chief executive, President Barack Obama. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is good to be at the National Action Network. It's good to be here with some good friends. I love you back. I'm here. It, 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 it is wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you uh, to your leader, Reverend Al Sharpton. Give him a big round of applause. And I, and I appreciate the idea of being an, an action president, although uh, I do also have style. I just want to point that out. I, I know it's not about it, but I just, but I do have it. Al's not the only guy with style. Uh, we've got uh, Barbara Arnwine here today, and we want to thank her. Cleo LeBron, thank you. Melanie Campbell, thank you. Mark Morial, thank you. We've got members of Congress, state and local officials from New York. And of course, we've got all of you. So thanks to all of you for such a, a, a wonderful welcome. Everybody sit down. Sit down. Al, Al doesn't know how to get back to his seat. Help, somebody help out the leader here. But don't make him jump over it. Okay, they're going to explain it. There we go. All right, you're going to be all right. Now, the last time I was here was three years ago, and a few things have changed since then. Uh, I am here as a second-term president. I have more gray hair. It's all right. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. I've got, I've got twice as many dogs. I'm glad I won't have to serve a third term because three dogs is too many. I can't keep on promising Malia and Sasha another dog. Um, of course, one thing that has not changed is your commitment to the cause of civil rights for everybody, an opportunity for all people. And that's been something that's been on my mind this week. Uh, some of you may know that yesterday I was down in Austin, Texas at uh, the LBJ Library to speak on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act and the man who signed it into law. And standing there, I thought of all the Americans 
known and unknown, who made it possible for me to stand in that spot, who marched and organized and sat in and stood up for jobs and for justice. And I thought of all who achieved that great victory and others, not just with respect to the Civil Rights Act, but the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act and immigration reform and Medicare and Medicaid and the first battles of a long war on poverty. And over the past five years, in the wake of the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, we've won some victories, too. Nearly nine million new jobs in America's businesses over the past four years. Seven and a half million Americans signing up to buy health care coverage under the Affordable Care Act. And millions more who've gained coverage through Medicaid and CHIP and young people being able to stay on their parents' plans. The rate of uninsured Americans is down. High school dropout rates are down. Our high school graduation rate is the highest on record. More young people are earning college degrees than ever before. We've made progress and we've taken action. But we also know our work is unfinished. Too many Americans working harder than ever just to get by. Too many Americans who aren't working at all. We know we have to do more to restore America's promise of opportunity for all people, particularly for communities hardest hit by the recession, particularly for those who struggled since long before the recession. Not only African Americans and Latinos, but Americans trapped across the country in pockets of poverty, inner city, suburban, rural. And we know what opportunity means. Opportunity means more good jobs that pay good wages. Opportunity means training folks for those jobs. Opportunity means changing the odds for all of our children through pre-K, something Mayor de Blasio's fighting for here in New York City. And it, opportunity means affordable higher education for all who are willing to work for it. Opportunity means answering the call to be my brother's keeper and helping more boys and young men of color stay on track and reach their full potential. Before I came out, I was in a photo line, saw my good friend Freddie Haynes, a great pastor from, from the great state of Texas, and he told me this summer they're going to hire 100 young men, pay them $10.10 an hour, maybe $10.50 as a consequence of this call, and the point is, is that my brother's keeper, that's not just something I do, that's not just something the government does, that's something everybody can participate in. Because we know these young men need support. Opportunity means making the minimum wage a wage you can live on. It means equal pay for equal work. It means overtime pay for workers who've earned it. It means continuing to extend the right of quality, affordable health care for every American in every state, because we've got some states that aren't doing the right thing. We have states who, just out of political spite, are leaving millions of people uninsured that could be getting health insurance right now. No good reason for it. If you ask them what's the explanation, they, they can't really tell you. And by the way, making sure our citizens have the opportunity to lead healthy lives also means dealing with things like the dangerous carbon pollution that's disproportionately affecting low-income communities. It means making sure that our young people are eating right, so you know, listen to Michelle. <laughs> I'm just saying. So we know we've got more work to do to bridge the gap between our founding ideals and the realities of our time. And the question then becomes, well, how do, how do we actually make these changes? How does it happen? How do we get a minimum wage bill passed? How do we make sure that those states that aren't 
yet implementing the Affordable Care Act actually are doing right by their citizens. It means being vigilant. We've got to be vigilant to secure the gains we've made, but also to make more gains in the future. And, and that's, that's the meaning of these last 50 years since the Civil Rights Act was passed. Because across the country, right now, there are well-organized and well-funded efforts to undo these gains. And one of those gains uh, is under particular assault right now, and that's what I want to spend the rest of my time here talking about. Just as inequality feeds on injustice, opportunity requires justice, and justice requires the right to vote. Johnson. President Johnson, right after he signed the Civil Rights Act into law, told his advisors, some of whom were telling him, well, all right, just wait. You've done a big thing now. Let's let the dust settle. Don't stir folks up. He said, no, no, I can't wait. We've got to press forward and pass the Voting Rights Act. Johnson said, about this, there can be and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. Voting, voting is a time when we all have an equal say. Black or white, rich or poor, man or woman, doesn't matter. In the eyes of the law and in the eyes of our democracy, we're all supposed to have that equal right to cast our ballot to help determine the direction of our society. The principle of one person, one vote is the single greatest tool we have to redress an unjust status quo. You would think there would not be an argument about this anymore. But the stark, simple truth is this. The right to vote is threatened today in a way that it has not been since the Voting Rights Act became law nearly five decades ago. Across the country, Republicans have led efforts to pass laws making it harder, not easier, for people to vote. In some places, women could be turned away from the polls just because they're registered under their maiden name, but their driver's license has their married name. Senior citizens who've been voting for decades may suddenly be told they can no longer vote until they can come up with the right ID. In other places, folks may learn that without a document like a passport or a birth certificate, they can't register. About 60% of Americans don't have a passport. Just because you don't have the money to travel abroad doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to vote here at home. And just to be clear, I know where my birth certificate is, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. I think it's still up on a website somewhere. <laughs> you remember that? That was crazy. That was some crazy stuff. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that in a while. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I want to be clear. I am not against reasonable attempts to secure the ballot. We understand that there has to be rules in place. But I am against requiring an ID that millions of Americans don't have. That shouldn't suddenly prevent you from exercising your right to vote. The, the, the first words put to paper in our American story tell us that all of us are created equal. And we understand that it took a long time to make sure that those words meant something. But, but 50 years ago, we put laws in place because of enormous struggles to vindicate that idea, 
to make our democracy truly mean something. And that makes it wrong to pass laws that make it harder for any eligible citizen to vote, especially because every citizen doesn't just have the right to vote, they have a responsibility to vote. So, yes, we're right to be on guard against voter fraud. Voter fraud would impinge on our democracy as well. We don't want folks voting that shouldn't be voting. We all agree on that. Let's stipulate to that, as the lawyers say. But there's a reason why those who argue that harsh restrictions on voting uh, are somehow necessary to fight voter fraud are having such a hard time proving any real widespread voter fraud. So I just want to give you some statistics. One recent study found only 10 cases of alleged in-person voter impersonation in 12 years. 10 cases. Another analysis found that out of 197 million votes cast for federal elections between 2002 and 2005, only 40 voters out of 197 million were indicted for fraud. Now, uh, for those of you who are math majors, as a percentage, that is 0.00002%. That's not a lot. So, so let's be clear. The real voter fraud is people who try to deny our rights by making bogus arguments about voter fraud. And I have to say, there have been some, some of these officials who've been passing these laws have been more blunt. They said, this is going to be good for the Republican Party. <laughs> I'm, uh, some of them have, have not been shy about saying that they're doing this for partisan reasons. Now, it is wrong, President Johnson said, deadly wrong, to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. It is wrong to change our election rules just because of politics. It is wrong to make citizens wait for five, six, seven hours just to vote. It is wrong to make a senior citizen who no longer has a driver's license jump through hoops and have to pay money just to exercise the rights she has cherished for a lifetime. America did not stand up and did not march and did not sacrifice to gain the right to vote for themselves and for others, only to see it denied to their kids and their grandchildren. We've got to pay attention to this. Some of the folks from Chicago know, Crider knows, one of the first jobs I had out of law school was to lead a voter registration drive in my home state of Illinois. We registered more than 100, 150,000 new voters. And as an organizer, I got to help other citizens exercise their most cherished and fundamental rights. That mattered to me. And as president, I'm not going to let attacks on these rights go unchallenged. We're not going to let voter suppression go unchallenged. So earlier this week, you heard from the Attorney General, and there's a reason the agency he runs is called the Department of Justice. They've taken on more than 100 voting rights cases since 2009. They've defended the rights of everybody from African Americans to Spanish speakers to soldiers serving overseas. Earlier this year, a bipartisan commission I appointed, chaired by my election lawyer and Mitt Romney's election lawyer came up with a series of modern uh, or common sense reforms to modernize voter registration and to curb the potential for fraud in a smart way and ensure that no one has to wait for more than half an hour to cast a ballot. States and local election boards should take up those recommendations. And with the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer almost upon us, I urge members of Congress to honor those who gave their lives so that others could exercise their rights and update the Voting Rights Act. Go ahead and get that done. Do it because the right to vote is something cherished by every American. We should not be having an argument about this. There are a lot of things we can argue about. But the right to vote. I mean, what kind of political platform is that? I mean, why would you 
make that a part of, of your agenda, preventing people from voting. How can you defend that? There are a whole bunch of folks out there who don't vote for me, didn't vote for me, don't like what I do. The idea that I would prevent them from voting and exercising their franchise makes no sense. Black or white, man or woman, urban, rural, rich, poor, Native American, disabled, gay, straight, Republican or Democrat. Voters who want to vote should be able to vote, period, full stop. <laughs> Voting is not a Democratic issue, it's not a Republican issue, it's an issue of citizenship. It's what makes our, 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 our democracy strong. But it's a fact, this recent effort to restrict the vote uh, has not been led by both parties. It's been led by the Republican Party. And in fairness, it's not just Democrats who are concerned. You know, you had one Republican state legislator point out, and I'm quoting here, making it more difficult for people to vote is not a good sign for a party that wants to attract more people. <laughs> that was a pretty, that's a, that's a good insight. Right? I want, a, I want a competitive Republican Party, just like a competitive Democratic Party. That's how our democracy is supposed to work, the competition of ideas. But I don't want folks changing the rules to try to restrict people's access to the ballot. And I think responsible people, regardless of your party affiliation, should agree with that. If your strategy depends on having fewer people show up to vote, that's not a sign of strength. That's a sign of weakness. And, and, and not only is, is, is it ultimately bad politics, I believe ultimately it, it, it harms the entire country. If voting is denied to the many, we risk ending up stuck year after year with special interest policies that benefit a fortunate few. And injustice perpetuates inequality. But remember, just as injustice perpetuates inequality, justice opens up opportunity. And as infuriating as, as efforts to roll back hard-earned rights can be, the trajectory of our history has to give us hope. The story of America is a story of progress. No matter how often or how intensely that progress has been challenged, ultimately this nation has moved forward. As Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, it bends towards justice. We move forward on civil rights, and we move forward on workers' rights, and we move forward on women's rights and disability rights and gay rights. We show that when ordinary citizens come together to participate in this democracy, we love justice will not be denied. So the single most important thing we can do to protect our right to vote is to vote. I, so I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one last point here. Uh, we're going to have an attorney general that looks at all the laws that are being passed. We're going to have civic organizations that are making sure that state laws and local laws are doing what they're supposed to do. We will fight back whenever we see, unfairly, the franchise being challenged. But the truth is that for all these laws that are being put in place, the biggest problem we have is people giving up their own power, voluntarily not participating. The number of people who voluntarily don't vote, who are eligible to vote, dwarfs whatever these laws are put in place uh, might, might do in terms of diminishing the voting rolls. So we can't treat these new barriers as an excuse not to participate. We can't use cynicism as an excuse not to participate. Sometimes I hear people saying, well, we haven't gotten everything we need. You know, we, we, we still have poverty. We still have problems. Of course, these things didn't happen overnight. When I was down in Texas, everybody's celebrating the day that the civil rights law was finally passed. Remember, there were decades in which people sacrificed and worked hard. 
Change doesn't happen overnight, but it happens as long as we don't purposely give our power away. Every obstacle put in our path should remind us of the power we hold in our hands each time we pull that lever or fill in that oval or touch that screen. We just have to harness that power. We've got to create a national network committed to taking action. We, we can call it the National Action Network. So I want you to go out there and redouble your efforts. Register more voters. Help more folks to get their rights. Get those souls to the polls. If they don't let you do it on Sunday, then do it on Tuesday instead. I know it's, it's better going to the polls on Sunday because you go to church, you get a little meal. You got the bus waiting for you. I understand, but you can, you can do it without that if, you, if we have to. We're at a time when we're marking many anniversaries. And it's interesting for me, you know, I've been on this earth 52 years, and, and, and so to see the progress we've made is, is to see my own life and the progression that's happened. You think about Brown versus Board of Education and the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and Freedom Summer, and with those anniversaries, we have new reason to remember those who made it possible for us to be here. Like the three civil rights workers in Mississippi, two white, one black, who were murdered 50 years ago as they tried to help their fellow citizens register to vote. James Cheney and Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner believed so strongly that change was possible, they were willing to lay down their lives for it. The least you can do is take them up on the gift that they have given you. Go out there and vote. You can make a change. You do have the power. I've run my last election, but I need you to make sure that the changes that we've started continue for decades to come. Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. The event. Okay, uh, I thought the president uh, did an amazing job. He, uh, he was focused on the key issues that are taking place in our community. Uh, voting rights, health care, um, you know, making sure that there's educational opportunities for all. But the one thing that he focused on more than anything else, which was so critically important to our constitutional rights, is our voting rights. Uh, you know, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of, of the civil rights movements that took place between the March on Washington last year. Uh, the March of Summit of Montgomery next year. Uh, all these things that are so critically important, but without voting rights, we cannot participate in a democracy. There is no democracy when there's no voting rights. And so, and so he gave just an amazing speech that, uh, that I thought was, was, you know, just, just rallied the base, reminded us that, you know, we, you know, we will, you know, we will not be moved. Uh, we shall overcome and we're going to make sure that we are exercising our right to vote so that the future generations and a future Barack Obama could be elected president of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ready? So tell me your name. Yes, I painted oil on canvas, portrait. Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> tell me your name. Hi, my name is Latrice Jackson. And uh, tell me about this portrait that you painted. This is a larger than life size oil painting on canvas of our beloved president, uh, Barack Obama, just commemorating his success and his amazing terms that he served us, um, making change in the U.S. Okay, now uh, tell me about how you felt after hearing him talk and also seeing the Reverend Sharpton. I was so moved and inspired. Uh, I also did a portrait of Reverend Sharpton. He's an amazing, amazing leader in this community. Um, very inspirational and they're changing lives. They're changing lives. Um, Barack Obama, I was very pleased that he touched on um, our voting rights and um, our, our ability to use it to, to create change. I think that is super important. We forget about the luxuries, we call it. Um, and for him to touch on something that we think is so basic that could you know, potentially be taken away from us is something that I think is really important. And I'm glad he spoke about it. And thank you for this poetry. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
guess someone else. Hello. Would anyone like to comment? I just want to get your feedback on hearing the president. Oh, very I've been pretty. Crying. No, you're, you're very pretty. I've been crying. Of course, you've been crying, but it's okay. It doesn't. It doesn't. You don't look bad at all. Trust me. I have been crying. So tell me why you were crying. Um, it was just a historical moment to see the president. So I got close enough to where I can shake his hand. And we were talking, and he was just like, you know, what's your name? And I was like, Candace Ransom. And then he was like, give me a hug, Candace Ransom. So I gave him a hug, and I got makeup on his uh, shirt. So he was like, don't get makeup on me, because Michelle will get me. And I was like, tell Michelle, I love you. So it was just like a funny joke, and my friend behind it got it, like, on camera. So, you know, it was just like, yeah, it was like the president. Like, I don't know. How thankful are you for... Um that Al Sharpton was able to organize this and put this together. I don't, if it wasn't for Al Sharpton, I would have never met the president. So, Mr. Sharpton, I thank you so, so much for just caring for our people, for fighting for our rights, and um, just preserving our, leg, uh, our legacy. And it just means so much. It, it, it means so much that Barack took the time to yeah. fly here and, and gridlock our city, you know what I mean? And, and to come out, and I'm, I'm just so excited. Like, I'm so excited. Like, I'm going to go back to work and cry and call my mom, call my dad, and be like, I met our first black president, and I'm so proud. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. And thank you, guys. Thank Dan. And I will be back next year. Thanks. Have a great evening. Okay, bye. Like, about, you know, listening to the entire speech. and also very hopeful. Um, he just continued to encourage us to keep focused and to concentrate on the issues that concern us all and to think about those things in fairness. And, you know, he talked about action, that this was a year of action. He decreed that and declared that and for us to stay focused on that and to continue to stay stirred up and on fire. So I'm excited. I'm excited I'm too. Excited. I'm excited. Did you get emotional? Oh, yes, I did. At one point, I felt like I was going to break down and cry because it was my first time seeing our president live and in person. Oh, my God. And how thankful are you to Al Sharpton that he was able to organize this? Oh, I'm very thankful. I'm the newly elected secretary of the Atlanta, Georgia chapter, and I ran unopposed. And due to Al Sharpton's founding of this great organization, he gives future leaders like myself an opportunity to work on those issues that concern us. And I'm concerned about the, not only the African American American issues, but issues of all people, especially Native Americans, because I'm half Native American. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you for all of your work, and thank you for the support. And thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts and my feelings. I'm so excited and ecstatic, I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm about to go to the moon. <laughs> and I hollered out at one point during his speech, I said, Georgia loves you, President Barack. That was too. me. I knew I was hollering Alabama. <laughs> Yes. Going through all of this. Well, give me some feedback about what you thought. Well, being a city council person, it's very rare that you see anyone that's directly connected with politics uh, be a president of a chapter. Yes. And I was very, very excited because the fight started in Alabama. We were the lead state where all of this racism and all of this count how many jelly beans in a jar and all of this, how many bubbles in, in, in soap. That's where it started at. The lawsuit that's taken, trying to take away our voters' right started in Shelby County, Alabama. So I have been leading this through NAN from the very first when it was filed, when it was put on the records, trying to take away our voters' rights. Without NAN, without Air Shopping, we would have not made a move in Alabama. You know, it, because we needed someone with weight behind us. And when we, we, when we really just launched the fight, we had over 50,000 people that we had to actually put them all in the, uh, in the Legion Field Arena in order to control the, the, the crowd. It was just so, it was so outrageous. We, He's just such a good man, Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, man, he is a great leader. This is... Um, the next, I don't care what no one said, the next Martin Luther King, uh, because it's a next, I don't care what it is. The only one that's not a next is a next God. It's only one God. But when you have a true leader, it's one behind them. And Al Sharpton is a, the second Martin Luther King, and he can capture people and, you know, and just give them so much 
positive uh, thrill to make them want to uh, fight. Yes. He is a disciple, like like the, he's a disciple of the Lord, and and he's a and he's a Christian, yes, he is. and he believe in nonviolence, but he takes no hostages when he's going at an issue, and that's what I just love about him. Thank you very much for everything that you said, and good luck with everything that you're doing. Absolutely, absolutely, and I'm going to be the next county commission in Birmingham, Alabama. Check with me after June 3rd. I can guarantee you that. Good luck. My name, my name is, I'm a city councilwoman, Sheila Tyson. After June, on June 3rd, call me at 11 o'clock. I will be county commission, okay. Sheila Tyson. Okay, Sheila, take care. <laughs> God bless. All right, let me get some more. Oh, I love your hair. So can we get something? Okay. So, so give me some feedback about hearing the president speak. I felt like I was in dreamland to be in the same room as him. He's so inspiring on voters' rights. And just knowing that he came to New York to share with us and to encourage us to continue to help fight for justice and all uh, and, injust, and, and inequality. And it just was a fabulous time just to be in this, energy, this kind of energy with uh, the president and everything that he covered on the new health plan and um, housing, labor. I, want, I think it's wonderful that they have a new initiative to help young black men. Yeah. And, so what, and even what the mayor is doing with um, pre-K. Yes, yeah, excellent, excellent. So there are changes that, that's happening. Um, another question is how thankful are you that Al Sharpton was able to organize this and get us access to the president? I, he's my hero. Reverend Al Sharpton, and it's like he makes miracles happen. He is, it's so impressive that he has the kind of communication and spirit that a person of that level, the President of the United States, Barack Obama, can be in, in unison with him to understand the same struggle, that he would agree to take time out of his very, very, very busy schedule. So kudos to Reverend Al Sharpton. He is awesome for getting the president here. It's, I mean, it's gonna be like electricity spreading. Wait, let me, this Thank you is- very much. Hi, Hello, sir. how are hey, you? How are you? Oh, wait, wait, let me give you a hug for everything you've done. Oh, thank this you, This is like, so it's a miracle to be in the well, Thank president. you so much. Okay. This is my grandson. Hi. Owen Burnside. So give us some feedback about hearing the president speak. Well, I think he challenged us to understand that this election coming up in November is the last and only time we'll be able to vote for his agenda. The vote in November for Congress and for uh, state level offices are all a vote for him. We need to empower the last two years of his administration so that he can complete the things he started already. That's what I heard the message. I heard a plea to us to understand the sacrifice that men and women made so that we can vote to exercise our problem, that we're going to fight those who start to take it away from us. But at the same time, we've got to get out numbers that are unprecedented in a midterm election if we're going to save this, uh, this administration's initiatives. And um, how thankful are you that Al Sharpton was able to organize this? Of course, with the National Action Network, everyone, you know, combined got this to happen. But how thankful are you for well, Al Sharpton? Well, I think, well, first of all, I'm the chairman of the National Action Network. Okay. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, Reverend Sharpton's relationship with the president is foundationally important uh, in our ability to bring him here for our dinner and to bring him here today. The fact that they built a relationship, he has an appreciation for Reverend Sharpton as a community organizer and a civil rights fighter. And Reverend Sharpton has used that to help usher our agenda forward and to lift the National Action Network. So we're all excited about it and grateful for his leadership. Why was it important to bring your friends? Well, it's important that we pass on our enthusiasm, our passion, our history, and our commitment into the next generation. So that when we are out, they'll pick up the mantle and understand that this all didn't just happen. That people made sacrifices. And for him to be able, at his age, 11 years old, to shake hands and to be in the presence of a president, that's an inspirational moment. 
inspirational for me. And so I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And what about you? How was it like meeting the president? Um, it felt really good. Um, it was exciting. Um, yeah, and that's all. Already have. <laughs> so you announced it. You announced it as soon as you came here. Yep. How was it seeing him live in person? What did you think he about him when you saw him? Um, I, I really don't know. Um, I just like, I was just looking forward to a good time, honestly. And do you think that like he inspires you to you know when you get? Of course, you have a great person already inspiring you, your grandfather. But some meeting someone like that. Does that make you want to get into the political world or? Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you all. Uh, Be well. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, I didn't no, know. That's all right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you. I'm just happy to be here, but thanks for all right, and Thank you, precious. Okay, thank you. So how can I get a copy of this? Is you? Okay. He's going to clean it all up. Very good. You want to get into? No, no. She just. Okay. I'll be back. I'll come back. I'll am in so I got to grab me. Be well. Thank you. So give me a response about hearing the president speak today. Well, it is always wonderful to hear the president speak, but it's especially wonderful to hear him speak at the National Action Network because it really shows his commitment to the grassroots and to community and to New York and to Reverend Al Sharpton. It was just a really, it was great to have him in the room. I thought he got a great reception. I thought he gave a great speech. Yes, absolutely. And what about um, the Reverend organizing this? This was very difficult to do, right? Oh, I mean, anytime you have the president or a vice president, but especially the president at an event, it makes logistics almost impossible. And considering what you have to go through and the hoops that have to be jumped through to put on something like this, it was, uh, it was fantastic. It really was amazing. I wonder if um, the people that attended, if they'll like go home now and kind of like be a little bit more dedicated to getting their, you know, community members to enroll, to, to vote and to, you know, just actually, you know, because I feel like to that's... participate in... Yeah, I feel like that's what... Well, that's, I, I mean, the, absolutely. And, you know, it is a call to action. And, you know, that's what the National Action Network actually is. It's a call to action. And the president, I think, redoubled people's um, drive yes. to do that and to be part of something because the National Action Network is doing so much and it is helping so much and it's dealing with the issues that the president is dealing with. So together, we can really make a difference. So we need people to join the National Action Network to support civil rights organizations in general and to get off their tushies and actually work with everyone to make a difference so that we can continue to take this country in the right direction and stop it going from the wrong direction. Thank you so much. And yes. And who are you and what do you do exactly at um, NAN? Well, I actually am Eleanor Tatum. I am the publisher of the New York Amsterdam News. Oh, oh my God. I read that magazine all <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I didn't much. know that. I thought you were. Oh, no worries. No worries. You have to, you, you have to, you have to let me know these things. <laughs> You're doing better, Just right? sending me out there all blind. <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. All right. Take Amazing. Care. Bless. Thank you. Oh, I gave my card. Yeah, good. Fabulous. <laughs> I have to check that out. Okay. So we got you outside when you were like lining up, waiting to come in. Now that you've heard the president speak, what do you have to say? Still excited, still anticipating action in our communities. He really spoke to us about making sure we take action. It was really about us making sure we remember the sacrifices of those that have come before us. It took decades for them to win their right to vote and to get many of us to vote, so that's something that we have to do. That's, that was the key message for us to make sure we keep our power, which is making sure that we vote. And don't um, get yourself too down about what's going on. The power is in you to make sure that you vote. So that's one of the key messages of the president. And I was so excited to be here yes. to witness and hear it. Really amazing. Awesome. Absolutely amazing. Do you feel like you um, now are re-energized to kind of go out in the community and kind of talk to people more about like 
voting and registering and stuff like that? Oh, definitely. I have a blog that's all about action, you know, like just inspiring people into action, you know, threshold world. It's really about the action, the point at which something is about to happen or does not happen, but it's up to you to take action to make it happen. That's beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a great day. Thanks. <laughs> was good okay so give me your feedback about hearing the president speak today um, it was great it was really an awesome experience um, he was just as everyone always describes very charismatic very funny very personable um, he's really a great speaker like not once did he look down it was it was awesome it's a great experience how thankful um, are you for this experience I know Reverend Al Sharpton organized this mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for it um, I definitely was not expecting this um, so I'm really glad that I came. It's definitely worth it. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cheyenne Norman, and I'm affiliated with National Action Network through Reverend Al Sharpton. He actually did the eulogy for my son, my four-year-old son, Yas, who was shot and killed almost two years ago now, uh, July 22nd. And Nan has been a second home to me ever since, and I am... I'm, in, I'm elated and ecstatic that he was, I was actually even invited out today. So I, I thank Reverend every time I get a chance to. How good was it to see uh, the president speak and address us? The, that was if not the highlight of my life. I, I really believe that this is the highlight of my life. I hope that I can surpass this in other ways, maybe more children or grandchildren. But as of right now to this day, this was the highlight of my life. That's amazing. And how thankful were you that Mr. Sharpton was able to pull this together? Because this was like a lot of hard work. Yes, I know. I'm actually very thankful for that because you you. You know that he has the pull with the president, but you never think that, you know, us as members are ever going to actually sit in a room, let alone hear him speak. So this was actually awesome. I'm really excited about this. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Okay. So tell me your reaction to hearing the president speak. It was a very good speech, and I enjoyed seeing him because I never saw him before in, in person. So it was a very good experience, and I'm glad... Mr. Sharpton invited me here today. You know, he's been a very big supporter of my family after Ramali was killed in 2012, and he's been very supportive of us. So I'm glad that he extended the invitation for me to be here tonight. Can you please remind me about um... Ramali? Ramali was 18 years old, and he was killed in 2012 by NYPD Richard Hayes from the 47th Precinct. Actually, tomorrow would, he would have been 21 years old. So, oh my God. And how was it seeing, how was it seeing the president and, you know, hearing him speak about, you know, all of that stuff? Because, you know, you, you have a personal stake in those messages. Yeah. The message was very powerful for me. Like I said, my son was killed by an NYPD officer. And with the youth today, uh, the, of today's, you know, it's, it's becoming all too common for this to happen, whether it's by police or us killing each other. We need to really put a grip on that is it's escalating and we have to put a grip on it right now before we lose more of our kids mm -hmm. um, remotely was killed the, af the officer actually broke into my home without a warrant a warrant and like two seconds later he was dead the officer was never even trained to be a narcotics officer and that's the duty he was doing at the time when my um, my son was murdered the officer was charged with manslaughter one and manslaughter two, and Judge Stephen Barrett decided to throw out the case on a technicality. And that angers me because a lot of times our black and brown kids go to jail on technicality, but it seems when it comes to NYPD, they're above the law. And whatever law is set for them, it should set for all, you know. Nobody should just broke in somebody's house and get away with it because if I broke in somebody's house to rob them and some somebody got killed in the process of it, whoever is with me is going to get charged. So even Richard Hayes was charged with the killing of my son, but his fellow officer was never charged. And we we pushing for that night right now. How supportive has Mr. Sharpton been with this case? He's been very very supportive. He was actually at the funeral and he'd been to a couple of um you know, he spoke up about it a lot on his radio show and at 
um, the nine on Saturdays. So he's very been supported. I'm really appreciate of him and all the elected officials that's been supporting of, and the community and um, the organizations that's really pushing. Because right now we have um, a petition that's going around that we asking people to please sign and to push the DOJ to take this case. Because right now our last shot is at the DOJ, you know, to take this case and prosecute this um, officer because. If he walks, it sends the wrong message to our people that you could, you, you could be a police officer and kill somebody and get away with it and no consequence. And we see this all too much because none of these officers that commit a murder never went to jail. So we hope this will be the case that set the example that you can't, you can't break the law and get away with it. Well, it saddens me to hear that, but good luck with everything. Thank you. I Thank you. That. So give me some feedback about hearing the president speak today. I mean, it was powerful. I mean, it was monumental. Uh, me as a young leader here in the city and, and uh, coming from Camden, New Jersey, I uh, was facing some difficult, um, you know, crises down there. We'll call it what it is. Um, to hear our president and to stand and see the giants and pioneers that paved the way, you know, here at the National Action Network with Reverend Al Sharpton and uh, our president, Barack Obama. I mean, to see that, I mean, I believe it, 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 it's history for me and it's something that I'm going to take back to my kids and, and, and tell them the experience that I had here. Um, and to hear, you know, uh, the 50 year anniversary of the uh, civil rights and, and the voting acts, um, you know, and what work needs to be done, you know, to come out of this with action steps. You know, I think he said it, uh, you know, the best that we are um, giving up our right, you know, voluntarily, you know, and, and, and for uh, the younger generation and, and other, gen and, you know, people that look like us of color uh, that can actually decide elections, midterm and presidential, um, you know, we, got, we have a voice and we have a powerful voice. And uh, President Barack Obama, he spoke in that today, and I'm excited to be here about it. Just completely excited. Now, what do you have to say about um, Al Sharpton putting this together, organizing this? You know, um, it's not every day that something like this happens. Right. Al, Al Sharpton, Reverend Al Sharpton, he's, he's a trailblazer. You know, and a lot of times when you step out in front, you're going to take those bows, you're going to take those arrows, sometimes some gunshots, they'll throw them in the front, they'll throw them in the back. But he's a man that persevered. He's a man that stood for what he believes in. And, and, and he's here and he's showing that and he's uniting the people, he's mobilizing the people, organizing the people and that's what it takes to be able to create change so you know my, my um, you know I've, I've high esteem for uh, Reverend Al Sharpton and I'm excited to be able to uh, be a part of the uh, National Action Network. Bottom line is we love him. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we love you, take care thank you bye-bye. Right, so you know today has been a very interesting experience thank you all for you know watching all of these interviews and seeing all of these people talk about how excited they are that they got to see the president. I, myself, was very, very excited and happy that I even got this opportunity. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton.